Hello everyone. I I hope things are working. Audio stuff like that. Yeah. Um. So. Um. Yeah. I, I like the Jeff esque title. I mean, you did think of it. Credit where it's due. So I was. I I was actually thinking. I had this very specific topic in mind, and I I told Auntie, well, I don't know the, I don't know what title to give, and he was like, emotional attachments, and I was like, yeah, makes sense. Um. Good afternoon. Oh, hello, Sander Baduk. Hello, Baby Shamble. Hello, everyone. Already here. Thanks for being early. So, yeah, this lecture topic was sort of uh, conceived very recently. And by very recently, I mean on Thursday. But it's something I've had on my mind for quite a long time, given that it's an issue that I've seen some of my students uh, grappling with. It's something very common, I think, among Go players. Um, and perhaps emotional attachments is a bit of an ambiguous title, perhaps intentionally so. We can ask Auntie about that, I suppose. And um, yeah, so what it means isn't... Yeah, it's a marketing ploy, Auntie. Yeah, so it doesn't mean... At attachments you play out of emotions, it means sort of like emotional investment that you make in the game, do things in the game. So you become emotionally attached to stuff on the board. Um, and that's a pretty big problem uh, for a lot of people, because Go is a rational game that humans tend to play a little bit irrationally sometimes. And by sometimes, I mean always. And I wanted to sort of um, exemplify the point I'm trying to make, before I, I make a formal introduction, I want to show you the game that made me decide to do this lecture. Uh, because it's a game I played on stream a couple of days ago, which maybe some of you, you know, may have watched. Um, oh, hello, Ro Roman Skygo. Don't, don't get mental to easy win. Nine done tip, kappa. Well, it's not necessarily that... It's not a conscious emotional thing. I don't mean that people will get like tilted and lose. I mean that we have a natural tendency to value stuff for non-reasonable reasons, if that makes any degree of sense. But okay, I wanted to start the, the lecture by going through a game that made me think about this topic very much. It, it's played against someone who's about EGF, I'm going to say 3 to 4 down EGF level, and it was played on my stream a couple of days ago. And... The reason I chose it is that this person and I had very different perceptions of what was going on in the game, and I attribute this to this uh, problem I want to talk about, that in my opinion he had. So, I was white, and I played some corner stuff. Beginning of the game isn't that interesting. We played some Josekis, and I pincer. This, well, this pincer, very questionable pincer. This is, yeah, so I, I write in my notes, slightly dubious. And the reason it's slightly dubious will become relatively obvious in the next few. So black attaches, which is good, I think, because we're preparing this weakness, uh, which I have to take care of. And eventually, black plays like this. And black has sort of swallowed my stone, right? Like, or not swallowed, that's the question. Has Black swallowed this stone? I think I know this game. Yeah, this game was played on stream two days ago, so a lot of you will have seen it. Um, anyway. Up until now, Black has made some wonky exchanges, in my opinion. So, for example, Black has made A for B, which helps my group out a little bit. White made C for D. Not White. Black made C for D. But also, Black may or may not have swallowed this stone. Right, so if this stone's just going to become part of Black's territory, then maybe Black has a good position, right? So here I had an idea, right? Um, what do you people think is the likelihood that White can live inside this area with this stone? Like inside these perimeters, sort of. Is it likely? Is it, is it possible? I'm I'm curious as to what people's thoughts are. Is white Katago? White's me. 
Unlikely. Okay, Sapo90 says unlikely. Um, likelihood correlated to rank. <laughs> Very low otherwise. Okay. <laughs> well, um, you know, in some ways, I'm not that dissimilar to, to Katago. Garden37. Okay. Uh, hello, Garden. Um, not able. So, it is true that the, the stronger the players are, the more likely it is someone will live, I think. So, I think a bot will 100% live here. I think I could live here. I actually thought it's pretty likely I will live here. I gave myself like a 90% chance of making life inside this area uh, after I was reading some variations. Now the second question I will ask the audience is, is it good to live here? Because that's a much better question, I think. Uh, so my thought process in the game was, okay, let's, let's play here, right? And pro Black's probably going to protect, right? And I'm gonna play here, and I'm gonna play here, and then Black could try to murder me, but... You know, I was like reading a rough template of how this fight could go, and I was like, eh, Black's shapes aren't very good, you know, um, maybe, what's my next move? Maybe I play here and like try to get out, it's not, not that easy for Black, so I was, I was having a look at this, not too in too much detail, and I was like, probably I can live. This, this isn't, it isn't hard to live here. But Zappo, Zappo90 says, not yet. And not yet is probably correct. So, first of all, this area isn't very big, right? Um, if living, losing at least Sente and giving Black a very, very strong outside. I agree with that, Garden. So, it's a dif in my opinion, it's a difficult decision. Anti says he'd go for it. I thought very seriously about going for it. Um, yeah, I don't know what black's supposed to do when white plays f3. So I thought about this very seriously. Eventually, I decided to bide my time and I played here. Then black exchanged this, and black played here, and now I went for it. So I was kind of on the fence, and I didn't know like what to do. And eventually, I went for it, right? Um, so the reason I went for it is sort of similar to Auntie's reason, I thought that Black's shape isn't very good, so after I play f3, this exchange is coming, which is going to be not not this move. But don't don't self Atari if. You... Um. So Black's shape is gonna suck, and if White lives, then it's at least a feels good moment, I guess. Uh, Miko, hello. So, um. So, I decided to live, right? For I think similar reasons to Auntie, and. You know, I let let's play this se this sequence out relatively quickly. Uh, Black did not play very well this sequence. I think I got a better result than I should have. Um, so essentially, in the sequence that leads up to this, a lot of the things that we had considered came true. So what came true is that White lived. I mean, Black can kill by playing this move locally. It kills, but. I mean, this is severely questionable. Just to make an example, if I play here, you really want to kill, you play here. You really want to kill, you play here. You really want to kill, you play here. And then white is going to get out. So, you know, it, black can still think about putting some pressure, but for now, white's, white's in practice alive. Um, so white lived but there are some significant prices to how I made life, right? So the first thing I can think of is Black got this move. This looks small, but this is actually endgame that Black got. Usually in most endgames, White's gonna play B2 and Sente, at least. Or, and maybe later get C1 Hane, stuff like that. That isn't possible. Something else that Black uh, got is this move, K2. And K2 looks pretty small, but, for example, it prevents white from getting this attachment, which isn't only good for points, it also strengthens white's group. Another thing that, you know, Garden mentioned is that, oh, suddenly black's group is pretty strong, right? We can, we can imagine black has these stones, all of them, right? Because black, you know, if black plays here, white sort of has to live somehow. Um, this move is de facto black sente. And if we consider all of these things, you could say that whether this is worth it or not for black depends on how much of a hard time he can give this group, right? 
because okay, white lived inside, but black got some some endgame profit, and more importantly, black is strong and white now isn't. So what black did in the game now sort of makes sense. He went for an attack. I played here just to like make sure that I'm alive. And black actually ignored me and started attacking. Um and you know, eventually I played here, black played here. I thought of Hane, but looked risky for assorted reasons because my own group isn't so strong. Uh, maybe I should have hunted. Not entirely the point. The, the running, this running fight happens, and eventually you can see that... Okay. Let's analyze the end results of this. What do you guys think of the position now? Do you think that White's invasion was worth it? Do you think that White has a good position now because of it? Or was it, as some people were suggesting, a little bit too early was Black's attack too good? Or are these influence stones a little bit too valuable now? Um, you know, I'm I'm curious as to what the audience thinks. I th I think that it's actually hard to say. Right? Um, this is a very nuanced position still. Um, and you know, eventually we we played out the second half of the middle game, and. I won, but it was not such an easy game. It's good, but only because you got R14 and O7 in first. Uh, R14 and O7. Uh, oh, you mean O17? Well, well, R17 and O7. Yeah, but if I got it's a if it's a good result because I got to play more moves on other sides of the board. You know, the other the other sides of the board also count, right? So, um. That, you know, that means that white would be good. Garden says he prefers black's result. Okay. So we have someone who thinks that, you know, white's definitely ahead on points at the moment, but black has all of this promising potential. Um, And maybe black's going to make something out of that. Black has more control. Yes, black does. Black, black has much more control over the board right now. And the question is whether black can turn all of this control into, um, into something greater. Right into something more concrete, and and to me this is a difficult question. What would you have played before invading? Um, so I think what I should have done is play here. So afterwards, I analyzed the game with my opponent, and we concluded that this move is good. And the reason that this move is good is that. First of all, it makes a base for this. So that means that all of this, you know, less random Tenuki move for black. If now we decide to invade and we live somehow, black getting strong on the outside isn't so much our concern anymore because the main reason black getting strong was important was that black got to attack this group. If this guy already has a base and eyes, it's not such a big deal. I mean, black strength is still useful, but I'm not sure it will be as useful as it was in the game. So during the game, we concluded R2 would have been a good move. And and here, maybe R2 will also be a good move. So at this point, R2 might also have been a good move for the same reason. And, you know, also, white maybe isn't in such a hurry to invade because black will be a bit reluctant to just go ahead and defend immediately, right? Um, I cannot see white complain by taking an amount of cash first. Yeah, I wasn't unhappy in the game, right? Um, it's a difficult position to analyze, but I thought white can't be bad. Um, what about R8? Try to force black uh, to push you into the center. R8. Now? R8's an interesting move. Very curious as to... Um, as to your idea with this move. Try to force black to push you into the center. Hmm. So, are you envisioning something like this? To me, this seems actually like the, I'm going to say, inferior direction of play relative to what you could do because it's like, it's actually weakening this group. And this side of the board is not that interesting. So, R R8 doesn't seem entirely optimal, in my opinion. Though maybe that's not your idea when you play R8, in which case I apologize. Um, 
It's okay. L let's go back to this result. Some people like white, some people like black. Uh, I wasn't sure, you know, um, but the really important thing and the reason I wanted to discuss this specific situation was that when I reviewed the game with my opponent, my opponent said he's behind by 20 points, right? Let me repeat, said he's behind by 20 points. And, you know, my opponent isn't a weak player, right? Um, and, you know, I was like, 20 points, really? And he's like, okay, okay, I'm behind by 10. And I still didn't believe him. Come on, 10, 10 points is a lot. Um, and what my opponent, Black, right, described about this game was that he thought this was his. Like, he didn't expect me to live. So when I lived and I took his 20 points, he's behind by 20 points. Like, his argument here was that he's behind by 20 points at this very point, right? And that maybe he recovered some of it by attacking, but he still thinks he's behind, right? And to me, this was a very interesting perspective because as far as I could tell, he was only considering that he had lost something that he thought was his, but he hadn't absolutely neglected to consider all the things that I paid to give him this, this good position. Uh, uh, like this good uh, invasion of mine, right? So he didn't consider that, oh, if he had kept his 20 points, right? If, if, if I hadn't never invaded and I had kept the 20 points, so let's say that uh, I would have played this in the game, right? I would have gotten some extra points on the side. I would have gotten a base on the side. Later, I'm going to get this, right? At least. Or like, I have the option to Hane later, which would have been good endgame. And... You know, in the game, I spent a move, right? That, that's another factor. You know, someone earlier in chat, I think it was Garden, mentioned, well, you spent a move for this, right? This invasion costs a move. So at the end of the day, I made some cash profit, but maybe less than it would at first seem. And moreover, I gave Black strength on the outside to fight my group, right? His 20 moves, uh, 20, move, 20 points move to the center. Um, yeah, his 20 points move to the center. The problem is that those points aren't tangible, and I know my opponent um, somewhat, I know his go, and I know that he likes points. So when his 20 points in cash turned into 20 points in 20 points worth of attacking strength and influence, he's like, I'm behind by 20 points, you know? Um, I understand your opponent, I might feel exactly like him myself. That's a problem. <laughs> Um, how easy is it to turn Black's new potential into points in the center? Well, it's not clear, right? That's why this position, it's very hard to evaluate who's actually better. If we look at what happened in the game, I eventually allowed Black to get a pretty strong shape in the center, and the next move. So, you know, if Black... Let's give Black a move like, um, maybe Atari here, and I'm probably gonna connect, I think? Uh, I could, I could play this and ah uh, no 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 this it feels too bad. So okay, let's let's play here and then let's give Black some jump or some extend. Black's definitely going to make some points here. And by the way, I'm not saying that these moves are good. I'm saying that Black will definitely make something out of this if he wants to. Even if he doesn't play here, he's going to make some points out of this center, and you know. Once he plays here, for example, he's definitely making something out of the top side as well. When Zappo90 asks, how easy is it? That's a very difficult question, and that's why many people prefer having points to influence, because points are safe. And, and this sort of goes to the, you know, this is where I'm going to uh, maybe introduce the lecture topic, which is that, in my opinion, as I define it, Black felt emotionally attached to his points, right? And even when he lost his points for something that, in my opinion, is reasonable compensation, right? I mean, in this area, there's much more than 20 points, right? Much more. And 
you know, if we consider that during his attack, black got this move as well, right? And white isn't getting this attachment, and white isn't getting this endgame, how much really did black lose, right? He lost something, but not as much as he thought he did. And while this center, it's unclear how much it will make, and that's why he's uncomfortable, it will make something. So, you know, I think when Jeff mentioned, I understand your opponent might feel exactly like him myself, I think Jeff would know that this position of his is not bad for him, he would just feel uncomfortable playing it, which are two different things. In the case of my opponent, his, you know, his proclivity for points actually led him to think he's badly behind in this situation, which just isn't the case, right? I, during the game, thought I'm probably a bit better. A bit better, you know, like, less than Komi. Um, definitely less than Komi. And if you ask a computer, a computer favors black. Um, you know, the Katago I put this into favors black by about three points. Um, which surprised me. Um, Katago obviously believes in the center more than I did. Um, I feel that either he was 20 points behind already, or he made a 20 um, point mistake in handling the invasion. Neither seems true. Yeah, that's another way. One thing of trying to dominate feelings like this, where you feel attached to a certain part of the board, is that you think about, did I do anything wrong, right? And if you didn't do anything wrong, significantly wrong, then, you know, if none of your moves were significantly low in value, if none of your moves were dame points, then you're not going to be 20 points behind. And, and Black didn't do anything so wrong, right? I mean, black, black shape isn't so good here, but, you know, in the end, he still gets strong-ish shape. He still gets Q2, you know? He still gets... You know, these, these uh, you know, center stone area, and he still gets Sente, right? Um, sounds reasonable to feel like that if he played the extra move J6 to secure the bottom. Um, well, keep in mind that J6, J6 is an exchange. Like, I, he didn't play J6 on his own. J6 was this, right? So, Black tenuki I played this exchange, and then I kept defending the attack. So, it's not like Black had to take Gote here. To clarify the order of moves. And, yeah, in any case. So this is perhaps the, um, the, the, the lecture topic at hand. A lot of people have this problem. Like, a lot of people have this problem where they assign value, or, like, they assign a game-changing value to something, right? Maybe correctly, maybe incorrectly. But more importantly, they aren't able to change their perception of the value, you know, based on, on what's happening in the game. So, for example, it, you know, my opponent thought, okay, I have 20 points here, right? And if you were asked, do you want to lose these 20 points? No, right? You don't want to lose these 20 points. But if you're, you're told you're losing these 20 points for X, Y, and Z compensation, then you can start considering it, right? And his problem was that he was so fixated on these points that he thought were his, right, on the lost property as he perceives it, that it marred his judgment of the game, right? Um, and this brings me to an analogy I wanted to start off the lecture with, right? So here we are all like, you know, we are all, all religious Go players, right? We, we like Go. We don't like chess, right? Um, and chat, well, actually, I say this as a chess player, but anyway, uh, uh, I digress. So in chess, <laughs> chess, <laughs> yeah, so in chess, the main objective, right, is to checkmate someone. I think, you know, most people will know that. And The biggest priority in chess is king safety, by far, right? You need to keep your king safe, you need to keep your king from being checked, because that means your opponent has forcing moves, if possible. You know, you need your king somewhere safe, and that actually dominates the game, right? Like, you have to protect your king no matter what. Chess isn't a game where you can give up any piece you like, and the game won't end. If you lose your king, you lose the game. and. That's one of the things that makes chess such a limited game, because people don't have a choice, right? The game, you know, like, 
if you get checked, you're gonna have, like, maybe, at, at most, you know, five or six legal moves, right? You can't choose not to move out of check, right? Um, and as a Go player, I feel lucky that Go isn't the same, right? So in Go, our options are infinite. Like, we aren't constrained to, make, to be made to play certain things. We don't have a king, right? Even though there are certain things that we value, they're always up to be exchanged, or almost always, right? There's almost nothing that isn't up for, for discussion, right? Um, even if you think, oh, I'm always going to answer this push, and this is one of the more extreme examples, there are situations where you don't, specifically Ko's, probably. Um, I'm giving a talk at work on AlphaGo after the holiday, and one of the main points is that Go AI is hard, um, because there's so little that happens that is easy to evaluate. Yeah, yeah. So in Go, things are a lot more nebulous, and that's a good and a bad thing, right? It makes Go, Go more fun in, in a lot of ways, right? And it makes Go more confusing, right? Because there's no, there's not such a black and white dynamic, right? Um, and this isn't to say that chess is an easy game, because it's not. But I would say that, you know, Go is a harder game. Uh, which is also <laughs> back, black and white. No. Uh, anyway, um, so the reason I bring up this analogy is that ideally in a game of Go, we would play like computers, right? We would be like, this is the move that gives me the highest percentage of winning, you know? And computers don't care about territory. They don't care about influence. They don't care about that stuff. Um, they care about their win percentage or their point lead, I guess. Um, and I think humans don't play like that, right? Well, we humans, we assign value to stuff, right? Like, when we think about R15, we don't think about, oh, does answering this give me the highest percentage uh, to win the game? You think, oh no, I don't want to get cut here, let's connect. And, and it, you know, it, it's the right move, right? But the thought process is different. And this tendency that humans have to evaluate things, um, like to, give, to assign value to things, is very dangerous because we're wrong a lot of the time. And that's why, for example, Telegraph Go, uh, actually I named my opponent, which I didn't intend to, but you know, I was on stream recently. Um, he assigned a value to this lower side territory and when he lost it he was too um too focused on that territory to consider what else he's winning what i'm giving up right to him it was mostly about that territory hence the comment that really really made me think about this which is i'm behind by 20 points right which is a comment that it's just absurd right and this guy's a strong player, right? He's like EGF 3 to 4 done. You know, he's he's a good player, right? And actually, this game wasn't easy for me to win. Um, but that comment was just amazing to me, that a strong player can can uh, have such such a perception. Okay. Um, and I would say that what I wanted to focus on for the rest of the lecture um, is just some examples of the types of things that generally cause people to be emotionally attached. Um, and I'm going to run through some examples, unfortunately some of them from NGD games, so you might see your game, um, your game on the spotlight. Um, and the idea is a bit to discuss, well, why are people overvaluing certain things? And what are, like, what, what types of things are they overvaluing and, and why? And also I'm going to try to suggest, well, maybe how you're going to stop doing that. Um, you're never going to stop doing that. But you're going to do it less and less, and that's how you improve. Okay. Um, let's go to a, a second example. Um, so, yeah, so this game is played by a student of mine who is white. He's white in this game. And this game's from a while ago, so I'm not sure if he will remember it too well. Maybe he's here, I'm not sure. Um... Okay, I would extend a question to the audience here. As white, what would be your next move? 
what what pops out at you as the next move let's say what's your first instinct um i'd say that you could look at group strength right you could say oh maybe these stones aren't so strong i want to look at them right um but i mean they aren't so weak right they're fine they're not gonna die or anything r4 yeah r4 would be my move right uh r4 k4 okay so someone wants to extend on the side right then someone wants to take a corner enclosure um those are reasonable reasonable moves to play right um because you could think about you know group shape and strength but it's not such a big deal the right thing to do would probably be to focus on the cache at the moment because there's nothing that um that urgent one move i'd consider as black potentially is to play the uh, as white is to play this because oh i'm a bit annoyed if black turns and suddenly i have shape issues so you know some moves to consider r4 would probably be my move and actually for the next um not for the next, for the previous, I'm going to say like 20 to 30 moves, the AI has been begging both players to play R4. Um, because that's how the AI rolls. My student played here. Um, which at first glance looks like a little bit of a small move, right? You're keeping this area. But this area isn't so big, right? I think we can agree. And this area is not actually that um, that well defined. Oh, uh, hello, Go Dave. Thank you for the raid. Welcome. Thirty minutes. Yeah, th this has been on for thirty minutes. Hello, Tangjie. R four is always the favorite move for AI if nothing is urgent. Yeah, for sure. Um. So White played this, and White, you know. White's logic seems to be to enclose some extra points, right? Oh, wait. There's a bot I need to ban. Okay. So... But it isn't so big, right? And we can also agree that it's not so clear how much of it you're keeping after Black eventually attaches here, right? There's some Aji. Um... But white focused on keeping these points. And the question to me is why? Because it seems like objectively a smaller move than just taking a corner enclosure, right? Um, or maybe defending your shape, probably taking the corner enclosure. Um, shout out Godev89. I don't think Nordic Dojo has commands going on. We could set those up. Might be an idea. Um, this is just starting the second situation. Cryptic comment. I'm afraid my, uh, I'm not entirely sure what that means. Um, so, okay. Why did my student play this? What would be a reason? So, perhaps to aid in this comment, I will maybe start with this move, right? So this move seems to have a logic. I'll attack black, right? I'll put pressure on black's group. And I'll also make something here at the same time. And we can see, um, eventually white plays j12, right? So j, you know, j12 is still indicating I have something over here, right? You know, eventually white played this move, which, you know, surprised me. Um, because this seems like the shape move, regardless of the point you are keeping or not. You would like to exchange this and then play whatever you wanted to play. But okay, white played here. And black exchanged uh, this finally and connected, right? And even though it seems like white has thrown this to the winds by not hunting, right? White actually decided to come back. And when I discussed this with my student, what he said was, I wanted to keep this area, right? Keep being the key word. Like, if you looked at this position on the empty board, right? You would say... Well, of course, this is the biggest move. Or, you know, someone someone also suggested K4. You're, you know, playing a move on the side. That's fine as well. Though a little bit less um, 
in accordance with modern theory. But, you know, you could play k4. White wasn't thinking that. White was thinking, this was mine, I want to keep it. Right? And that's... That's a... A degree of just not being sufficiently flexible about the things that you have in the game. Right? And, you know, I think that this... This is actually something that my student and I have been, you know, working on um, together. And I think he's improved a lot at this. This game is actually from a few months ago, and I think he wouldn't do this again. He's actually improved a lot. But this kind of thing where we are attached to this area and we want to keep it happens to people a lot, right? Uh, white, I don't think that many of you would think G13 is the best move. But if you were in the game, I think a lot of you would still play it. Right, and this is what I'm going toward. Okay. Let's draw up a next example. The next example is... Okay. All of us like cutting stuff, right? Right, and this, th that's what this... This, um... This, um... Maybe... Example is going to be about. We all like cutting stuff. And, you know, some of us really dislike getting cut, so we look out for not getting cut. Right, there's the flip side of it. You can you can focus on not getting cut. And you can also focus on cutting stuff. People do both. This game is played at like five to four Q level, um, I think. And it's a Nordic Go Dojo game. And let's go to the move indicated. Okay. Which move would you be looking at here for white? What's your instinct? Wait, actually, I'm I'm a bit curious. For some reason, I'm sorry, people. I just looked at my other screen and I saw that there's a bunch of people commenting stuff, but on my other screen, it isn't visible. Okay, so excuse me. Um, I think it's Kemadactyl. Uh, um, um, yeah, I've been ignoring people for a few minutes. I'm sorry about that. I just didn't see. There was some bug and it wasn't updating. Um, I would even thought to give up K14 stones if Black uses a few moves to capture them. Um, yeah, yeah. Actually, if we go back to that example, right, and here. Here. These stones aren't so big. You could consider sacking them eventually, yes. And that's the kind of flexible mindset that will lead you to win more games. As long as you're being rational about your decision making. Um, I dislike J13. Black can take the stone if he wants. Yeah, even J13 might already be an overinvestment here. I agree. Yeah. Um, I think it's easy to overestimate center territory too because of the number of uh, stones it takes to do. Yes, yes. Also very easy. White maybe, when he played this, wasn't considering, well, I'm going to have to defend this, and I'm going to have to defend this, right? And in the end, it's like 10 paltry points, right? Um... Yeah, J13 is kind of the problem, yes, indeed. I'm emotionally attached to attacking anything that doesn't move. Ah. Okay. Um, but okay, now, now I've caught up. I'm really sorry about that. Somehow my, my uh, chat wasn't updating. Um, so let's go back to this game. And 39. Someone wanted to play R9, right? We wanted to play R9 as white. Um, somewhere on the right side, 2-9, right? Um, that's, you know, that's reasonable. Someone suggested K-16, which is a bit of an interesting move. Um, if you want to play in the local area, I'd much rather play H-3 because you're more directly affecting Black's shape. And, you know, Black could cut, but... Um, ah, K-16, uh, K not K-4, excuse me. I'm bad. Yeah, K-16 is a much better move. Um, my bad. So, okay, we have some good ideas. We have K16, we have uh, R9, we have Q9. Lots of good ideas. Moves on the side, you know, you could consider making this corner a little bit more solid. Lots of ideas. All of these are fine. So, White's move will shock some of you. White cut. Right? Um, H9, someone suggests. H9. H9. This one? Form pie. 
I might have um I, I might have misinterpreted Yes as white. You want to play h9. Interesting. What's the idea? You want to attack the Ponuki? It's a ladder breaker. White actually already has the ladder. White has I mean also it's not a ladder breaker, but if this if this ladder worked, it wouldn't break it. Ah, uh, in the bottom right, true. So you can play like this. Oh, true, maybe. But that seems like an awfully specific re reason. So this move, I think you're looking at maybe this group as a target. But keep in mind that groups that make ponukis are very hard to attack, right? And, you know, this move may seem absurd to some people, but... You know, some people will also find this move absurd if they're not in the game. Um, but still, you know, uh, uh, you know, the player who played this is about 4Q, not a bad player, but he still went for this. And I want you to watch the sequence that ensued, and we can see what happened, right? And the fact that, uh, of, you know, this player isn't bad. This player is like 4Q. The fact that a 4Q went for this really surprised me when I reviewed this game. I was like, wow, you know, he cut again. Um, what do you mean he cut again? Not quite sure what you mean. Um, but yeah, it... After the sequence? Oh yeah, after the sequence he cut again, yeah. I mean, at that point, what else can you do? You have to cut. But this game didn't go well for white, as can perhaps be predicted from, from this sequence. White was just too behind after this. He, he did cut, but I mean, it's, it's not necessarily bad for black, right? Black attached, black pulled out, and actually black just captured the two stones in the end. So black got a very nice result. Let's talk about this. because. I think if you looked at this position, um, it's very hard to consider anything that isn't some move on the side. Like, if, if you're looking at this position, someone shows you the position, right? Usually you'll just focus, oh, let's just play some big move, right? Which is what most of you did. That's good. Um, regarding h9, the idea was to cancel some of the Ponuki's influence, attempt to make it heavy, use g4 thickness. Decrease black central control and potential there while also mildly building at the top side. Well, that's a lot of value you're assigning to a move. Like, the, the, those are a lot of things that h9 sort of does, but doesn't really do. So, for example, let's play here. And let's maybe play here for black next. Just play some solid move, fix a cutting point. Actually, no, let's, let's play here. Right? Um, or let's Tenuki. Actually, um, a stone that is so close to influence isn't going to be very useful. Like, when you're putting a stone next to a Goliath of a Ponuki like this, yes, you're negating the influence, you're, like, you're reducing the influence of this Ponuki. You're also spending a move to do it, and your stone itself is not very useful. Like, you aren't building a top side. There isn't a top side to build, right? Um, and here, white does have a strong stone, but you're not going to do anything with it. So, the point is that whether black tanukis or black answers, your stone is too close to black's influence to be very effective. So you're saying, oh, I want to limit black's potential, H9 is limiting itself. Like, the value of H9 is much less um, direct, concrete, and, you know, um, e easy to, uh, to put into words than the value of just enclosing a corner, right? So while it does reduce the value of the ponuki, it, the, the move itself isn't very valuable, is it? So... Um, White probably didn't imagine the squeeze after cutting felt immediately com committed into playing it out. Yeah, so for me, this cut is the ultimate example of, of 
um, an emotional attachment, because even though it's an emotional cut. Um, when black played this, what white should say is, oh, even if I play this move, black's just gonna tenuki, and, you know, later black has this kind of move to get his stones out if he wants to try, and later, you know, black can play f10 in center if he wants to, right? So, this, act this actually isn't a big area in the first place, and taking these stones isn't going to help attack this panuki, right? And the right thing to do is tenuki, and just accept that you made a bad exchange. But white, I mean, also, white should really Atari, right? Um, so, Atari is just a better move order because if black connects, you kill, or, like, black's in trouble. And if black plays something like this, then you'd, you're not going to play this move now, which is what the real game amounted to. Um, so white, for some reason, read this sequence out and still played it. And I think the reason is that once white cut, it was very difficult to not cut, right? If that makes sense. So, to me, this was a big problem that a not weak player had, right? White definitely has the level to know that this move isn't bad, right? Um, yeah, how good your move does everything you want to do, 10 things in one move. That cut seems like hopeful reading, expecting black to push the stone out, and the follow-ups are, oh, that was really bad, but I have to follow through. Exactly. So you guys understand what's going through white's head. That's another problem that people have. Very difficult to admit mistakes. Like, if you do something wrong, and things start going wrong, like black does this to you, wh white should still tenuki, actually, right? White shouldn't subject himself to making this shape while black keeps making outside shape, but white can't help himself. And this isn't to make fun of white, I would do this too, right? Like, like if I had, um, if I had played e11, I would capture the stone. I wouldn't help myself, you know? Ever, all of us would do that once we've made that mistake. Um, um, I find that emotional attachments to certain parts of the game tend to be one-way reading. Both examples you just showed look exactly like that. That's another thing, when people, people tend to read very optimistically. Like, one of the things that happens when you're emotional, or like, when you're thinking about this kind of stuff, is that you, uh, well, one of the things that people do wrong is that your opponent doesn't answer the way you expected. So, as someone met, pointed out, probably we were expecting Black to do this, and then like, some fight, right? That's what White was expecting. So when Black does something that you didn't expect because you didn't read um, as rigorously as perhaps you should have before playing this move, then things start to go wrong because of your expectations being sort of shattered. Um, so that's, that's another issue people have. And all of these are very difficult things to deal with because we're human, right? Like, very easy to say, oh, look at how emotional this person is. Look at how bad they played. Try playing the game yourself, right? Um, also, let's ban this bot. Um, so, gotta save face. Yeah, that's another problem people have, and that's an even harder problem to fix. How about e11 first? Black shape does look very enticing to attack. Not necessarily easy to make two eyes, but the black crew can easily become a liability. Ah... Uh, this group, this ponu if this ponuki become okay, I'm going to say that this black group could become a liability. Yes, that's true. I'm. I also think that this group is about equally likely to become a liability as this group. It's about equally likely. That's my guess. <laughs> um, because I mean, this is a ponuki. This has. This can jump, you know, it can jump anywhere in this area. Ponuki means it already has an eye. It has fantastic shape. Could it become a weak group? Yes. That doesn't mean that white should invest into trying to make it weak. Because it's very unlikely that that'll pay off, right? Much, much safer, according to Go principles, would be to just enclose a corner, right? Um, than to invest in attacking a ponuki, right? Um, now, to be fair 
uh, to Vormpice point, e11 first is fine. Because you're making use of the cutting point by making a profitable peep. This, these, this exchange is actually good for, um, for white, just because white stone is more towards the outside, so it's going to be more useful. So e11 in itself is fine. I'm just saying that you shouldn't play it with the mindset of attacking a ponuki. Um, yeah, so e e11, e10 is a good exchange for white. I agree with that. Black would ideally like to play more efficiently. That's true. So if you're getting this exchange, definitely you go for it. But I wouldn't be looking for more if I were white. But I have a dream. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, I have a dream is how you lose games. Um, in fact, if we have time for it at the end of this lecture, my plan is to, um, to show you guys a game where I had a dream and I got crushed for it. Because I like my dreams. Um, Oscar wants to stop being like a Spartan and be more like Zhuge Liang. Now, I don't know who Zhuge Liang is, but maybe. Um, anyway. So, White got wrecked here, right? Um, stop playing like... Hmm, still doesn't explain who Zhuge Liang is, but okay. Zhuge Liang. So... I wanted to point this out just because it looks like such an obvious mistake, and all of us are like laughing at the mistake now. The player who played it's laughing at the mistake now. That doesn't mean that you won't do it in your game, right? Um, and at some point during this lecture, probably after I show a couple more examples, I want to discuss how you can try to avoid having this happen to you, right? Um, but anyway. Let's see. Zhuge Liang is a is uh is Shu strategic general under Liu Bei. Okay, I don't know any of those people, but I guess I guess strategic general means that yeah, str being a strategic general in Go sounds better than being a Spartan. Um, I, I can assure you of that. I you know. yeah, this is a feels bad man. Yes. Hmm. But it is from the worst mistakes that sometimes you can learn the biggest lesson. That's sort of the point. Okay. Um, the next big topic I wanted to look at, which is something that a lot of people very commonly um, uh, play what I'm going to call emotionally, or like they are emotionally invested in it, are Ko's, right? You guys, you guys know about Ko's. Like, you see a Ko, and you win a Ko, right? That's what people think, which they shouldn't. Um, yo, hello, Flattermouse. Um, welcome. So, I want to go here to move 91. Let's see, where are you? Mm. Okay. I feel like I know the, the next game. Yes, you do know the next game. So... You were black. Um, so, black, baby shamble, uh, invaded, right? And, and this is, you know, the dreaded invasion, right? Um, where whites, you know, every white player on the planet goes like, oh no, I need to read this. And oh no, my territory, right? Um, interesting theme for a lecture, good idea. Thank you. I hope I'll do it justice. Um, big goes are, big goes, big goes are stressful. I, I think I tend to ignore the first co-threat I can get away without losing rather than looking for my next threats. Um, yeah, people... It, it depends on the person. A lot of people are really uncomfortable with co's, which is, which is one bad way to be emotional about it. A lot of people are really um, obsessed with winning the co, and that's what we're going to look at today. So, white played here. Um, black, uh, black should probably play this move. Um, and this is something you guys may be acquainted with. If white plays this, then black's gonna cut. And I think that the official theory on this is that if something like this happens, and then white goes back and, you know, does something like this, then black is usually going to get enough center moves on the outside to, to compensate the fact that he died in a corner that wasn't his in the first place. So let's envision uh, some sequence like... Mm, this... Um, 
this. This is the kind of thing I can envision, right? Um, something like this. If white wants to keep, and then black's getting some nice influence. So usually what's going to happen is that white plays here. And then when black attaches, and white sometimes can play here, and it's complicated, white can play here. White can try to kill, but then white has to figure out this cut. And this particular situation would be very complicated because black, you know, black's pretty strong around L18, so white, both of white's groups are cut and not alive. So this would be very complicated if white wants to kill, right? I could imagine that in this type of game, white would actually let the stones go, uh, let the stones live. And then that's not the end of the world for white, because white got sent, then white got some uh, yose. I think white probably should have um, played this way in this situation and just allowed black to get some good endgame. Co-threats are like a godsend for a change to make a comeback. Also, a change to ruin your game. Co's, uh, you mean co's. Yeah, co's are... The reason for that is that people are bad at co. Like, you know, I think... Um, I always like to say that the biggest difference between most six stuns and most one stuns is the end game, and the reason it's not co is because six stuns also suck at co. <laughs> um, yeah, co's hard. Um, anyway, so but so black's move is a little bit imprecise, and um, black black can you know white could have been very like severe here, but white wasn't. Uh, this is still very complicated, because if you want to kill, there's some cutting points. Tough stuff. White decided to play here, and Black, instead of playing this move, which is the better move to live, Black plays here. And White can actually kill here, and if some of you want to, you can make this Sumego, right? Yeah, you messed up here a bit, yes. White can actually kill here unconditionally, locally. So, uh, you guys can read it if you like. There's a lot of issues still because white has a cutting point here, so black's gonna push out and it's just a mess. This position's a mess. White instead played b18. And now we start the famous co. Um, okay. Co's are very interesting. And the reason they're hard for people to evaluate is that you need, like, in order to win a co, you need to get two moves in a row. Right? But you don't get two moves in a row, or like, if you do get two moves in a row, you, get, you give your opponent two moves somewhere else. Right? And that makes people make strange decisions. So many people, many people, in my experience, tend to in, like, invest into a co and will move heaven and earth in order to win it. Right? Um, it helps to define winning a co as gaining the most while the co remains all unresolved with the least risk, ideally nettlesome for the opponent. I think it would help to define win the co because people think of winning the co as in being the one who wins the co, like who captures this stone or this stone, right? But win winning the co should actually be who gets the good result following a co, right? Because here we're going to see a, re a result where white wins this co and gets an absolutely losing position. Right? I imagine winning the co is gaining the most value. Exactly. But people forget that. Another make, uh, mistake people make is that they tend to not respect, when they make a co, they tend to not respect the fact that they still haven't won the co enough. This is a problem I had in the past, and I, I still have, because my, the, like, the next example is me messing up a co for this reason, that I don't respect that I need to play two moves in order to... Um, to win the code, to actually finish it. Hello, Baduk Bum. That that's a great emote you got there. That's you know that's a solid emote. Uh, welcome. Um, I think most people understand that when they didn't have much there in the first place, i.e., Black would be happy to lose the corner and get compensation. White really wants to kill. Um. Yeah. So, I think one of the issues for White, another reason that White handled this co a little bit strangely is that white probably perceived this corner as his own. And actually, when we reviewed the game, because like uh, he's, he's now my private student, then white said, I should have played here. This was my biggest mistake of the game. 
And I said, no, 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 your biggest mistake of the game was how you handled the co. But your second biggest mistake was not fixing here. And then white would probably be ahead. Um, so, anyway. White probably perceived this as his territory, so when black invaded it, white moved heaven and earth to try to kill black, right? Like, white's in a murderous mood here. And here's where the harmful co-threats start. So you play this, which is bad for endgame. Um, then this Hanya is fine. Then black takes. Then white plays here, and allows black to play R18. So white played a minus one point move to give black endgame at R18, right? So black takes. Sorry, white takes. And black makes a co-threat that's, you know, the advantage of black's co-threat so far, and the reason why black did well in this co- is that Black didn't give up the rest of the board for this co. You know, Black's co-threats aren't a minus, right? So when you're playing co, you need to remember that you're still negotiating, right? You're not at war. You don't... When you're at war, you sink all of your resources into the war, right? Like, blow up, you know, you blow up your budget, and you, you know, you, you spend everything just to fight this war. Co's aren't a war. Co's are still a negotiation, right? But we can see, you know, um, we can see that white, when he cut here and gives black this ponuki, which takes the point and base of this white group, white's still treating this like a war, right? In this case, black isn't closing the call, kind of sent it towards the white outside group. Yeah, you're completely right, um, um, comorphism. Yes, that's a big issue as well. This co is very heavy for white. Actually... If white wants to play the co, he does need to play co-threats this big, right? He does need to, because there's no co-threat, like, okay, this co-threat would maybe be big enough. Um, but other than the co-threats on the left, if white plays, for example, a co-threat here, actually, that isn't a co-threat, but if white's like, oh, I'm going to, like, you know, let's make some random small co-threat. I'm going to play here. Black can cut through, and suddenly this white corner in territory is two weak groups, one of which is surely going to die. So, and for those of you who think that this kills black here, black has this move. Um, so, anyway. White has a very heavy co. So white's actually correct that if he wants to keep playing this co, he needs to keep sinking money in, into this negotiation. And that's actually why the correct move, as heartbreaking as it may be for white, all the way back here, was actually to do this. But this is very difficult for white to do, because after all, this was what white perceived as his corner. Like, white at this point must, must have been thinking, oh my god, I played this move, which is a, like almost a dame move, right? Or like a small endgame move, and suddenly my 15-point corner is gone. And like, this group isn't completely alive. Like, black could, you know, one could imagine that black will peep here and like here and it actually doesn't have two eyes so reduced from a 20 you know point corner to like five points that aren't alive yet not a hundred percent and you know white did, does get this end game but it was true that white did lose something so if white had just protected the corner white would have been good to go white's actually better here should have played all the hannes first um, yeah, I guess so. Um, a small tip for some of you, if you're scared of this invasion, but you don't want to take Gote, one good thing to do is actually to play B14 first. So if you exchange B14 and then you Tenuki, which you shouldn't, you should still connect, but if you wanted to Tenuki, now this is a bit easier to answer because now Black can't cut here because he's in Atari. So you're gonna do this. So that's a tip if you want to defend the corner without, you know, um, um, without spending a move. Um, Kode, how was your Corona Cup game? I guess it wasn't, uh, doesn't, doesn't sound like it went well, unfortunate. Um, okay-ish, but certainly my worst game in Corona Cup. I see. Okay, so... 
we can see why white reacted this way, right? We can see. So it, it's, it's pretty clear that white's issue is that by the end of this co, oh wait, this is the variation I, I, I demonstrate during the review. Let's look at the final result, right? White captures the co, right? Um, but look at the damage, right? This is when, like, this is like a country spends, you know, you know, billions and billions and billions of, of monetary units into a war, and then they, like, win the war, and then, and then this is what the country looks like, you know? Um, sort of, right? Except white didn't have to fight a war, you know? So... You look at these guys, these guys after white after black plays S17, they don't have a base. This Ponuki, you know, remember how earlier um someone was saying uh Vormpai was saying, oh um Well, we could attack this Ponuki someday, and I'm like, no, it's very unlikely. This Ponuki's getting attacked. You know? Uh all the wives are dead, all the Russians are gone. Yeah, correct. Um and we have a fan of uh, Godave in the chat. Cool. So, White got in so much trouble, right? Remember that this was the corner that White used to own. So basically what happened is that White played here, right? White played here. And in exchange, Black got this move, this move, this move, got to capture this Ponuki, and gets the next move. That's what happened. And okay, black played this exchange, which is bad. So, white got a terrible deal because of this investment in the co, and this is actually a very common phenomenon. Uh, you know, and maybe some of you will be thinking, oh, white uh, made such a big mistake, I wouldn't do this and stuff. I'm going to show you me doing this. The next game, the next game is me, you know? Um, Godev says, like, uh... Third five done in a row in Corona Cup. I'll beat more five duns next year. And if I can't beat them, I'll just have to become one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you can't beat them, join them. That's why I'm trying to become pro. Um, also a fan of you now. Thanks. I like your hair. Oh, thank you. Um, also impressive command of English for a second language. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. So, um, let's go to the next game. So now you're going to be less impressed with me now because I'm going to show you possibly the worst game I've played in a while. Um, so this game was played on stream in the same day that I played Telegraph Go. Um, and, you know, okay, the game, this was played on stream and my... Someone spent channel points and made me play with this opening to start with. So, you know, it's, you can see it's maybe not the most serious game. But, you know, people, you know, some, some of my students say, I don't want to show you this game because I played so bad. And I actually disagree because I think the worst games are the ones you can often learn the most from. Though in this game, I was sort of kidding. So it's a bit, you know, I can still learn stuff from this. Um... What about the emotional attachment of, about being behind, feeling we always need to invade to start bad fights? That also happens, yes. It's not something I'm going to address this lecture, but it's definitely part of it. Um, yeah, the slightly off Chinese wall. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, the person who spent channel points told me, play the Great Wall of China, but all one to the left. So that's what I did. Okay. Um, we can see that... White sort of connected this group, but if I really want to, I can cut like this and take play this, and white technically isn't alive yet. And this is the obsession that started to fester in my head while I was playing the game, right? And we're going to see, um, if we look far enough to move 115, how I did... Uh, how I turned this uh, obsession into a huge overplay. Okay, we look at this point in the game. Uh, game's a little bit crazy. Um, I lived on the right. 
White lived on the right. I invaded the corner. Um, I died in the corner, but there's quite a lot of Aji if I play here and it's some kind of weird semi-dori. The game's a mess, right? As all games played on the Fox Go server are meant to be, this game is a mess. Um, but here, you can see I played this move, right? I finally went back to my old plan of let's attack this group, right? And I play here, which is sort of attacking white's group, right? But locally is terrible shape because if white were to win the co, I'm also losing a lot of points. Probably the more sound move would be to play here. Like I play this move. And eventually, if I want to put pressure on, on White's group, I can play this move instead. Something like this would be more sound play. In the game, I Atari, okay. White played some exchanges. White played here, which I think is a misread because I think White actually wins the Semedori. Um, if I try to kill him. Like, otherwise, it, I think it's a Seki, but White shouldn't care about that too much. Um, not at this stage of the game, I think. Actually, it might not even be a Seki because after white pushes through, white gets extra lead. Hard to say. Anyway, white defended. And then I started in my co. And let's skip a few moves forward until the board clears up. Yeah, let's go to here. You can see that this is a co, right, for white's group. If I win it, white's locally dead. Something else we can see is that my shape on the outside is super questionable, right? Like, this is a threat for white to live, this is going to be a threat for white to live, this is going to be a threat for white to live, this is going to be a threat, this is going to be a threat, this, 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 all of these are threats for white, basically, because this, my other group is also dying. So, very, very questionable shape for black, right? My shape on the outside really, really sucks, right? So every single move white plays locally is a local co-threat. So let's keep that in mind. White plays this move, right? And I played S16, right? So you remember how last game, white started playing these really harmful co-threats on the top right? That's exactly what starts happening now to me, right? This co, where white has 3 million local co-threats, which is barely an exaggeration, also has this also has this, also has this, right? And, the, and what I do, like, faced with so many co-threats, right? I think the correct thing to do would actually be to play normally. Like, white does have infinite co-threats, but fortunately, I have infinite moves left in the game. Or, like, more infinite than his. If Well, I know that doesn't make sense, but I should be playing normal moves. I should play here... I should invade the corner, I should play here, I should play normal moves. And then if white defends, then white played a slow move to make life. That's what I should do. What I did do is I killed my invasion on the right side. Um, he has finite co-threats, but you have more finite moves to play. Yes, that's more accurate. But okay. Uh, oh, this was, by the way, a misclick. Um... So yeah, this game was not the most highest quality. Let's ignore that for the purposes of this lecture. And white defended because I don't know why. If I were white, I would have connected the co already. But okay, we're, we'll forget this blip in the radar. And co-threat, and I play here, right? Another harmful co-threat. I play here, another harmful co-threat. Okay. And eventually we can see that I've killed my invasion here, right? I killed it. And what happened eventually in the game is that I played this move, white played here, which is a better way to win the co, and I play here. And, and this is extremely bad for black because once that white has all of these stones, my group in the middle is hanging. Like, this group's gonna suffer if I want to live with it, right? Another reason is that this is much worse in terms of living than if I just directly sun sand because white well, can play here and this is like locally uh, dead or like I mean I uh, lose these stones in Gote or white can even make a ko here isn't this a ko shape 
I oh, know, uh, this, this, and this. Yeah, this is locally a co-shape. So, or I could give up the stones and let him keep his corner. Why has, the shape sucks. This was terrible. And according to the computer, from a 50-50 game, before I played D8, which was the original culprit of all of this, where I, I, I played a, a locally suboptimal move in order to even get this co, remember, right? Um, now I've played all of these threats and I've played D8. The game's lost for me. I'm super hard losing. The game's over. Now, this game was of such a suspicious character that about 15 co's and 360 moves later, I won. Um, because this game was really suspicious. But I didn't deserve to win. Uh, and, you know, here I, you know, I did exactly, you know, the, the day before I'd been talking to my student and saying, oh, here you fixated on your co and you, you shouldn't have, right? Like, look at this co. Um, um, and, you know, you fixated too much on this co and you gave up everything. And the day after, I did the same thing, right? So, go is hard. Co's have this tendency to warp your perspective and make you consider only the co instead of other stuff, right? And that's sort of the point of emotional attachments, which is that we forget about the rest of the board or we forget to correctly evaluate the rest of the board because we're too fixated on one thing we want or we're too hung up on one thing we lost, you know, and, and that's why people tend to feel bad. And, you know, uh, one thing I realized uh, about Go as I've been getting stronger is that very rarely is an exchange, like an exchange of one move for another, an exchange of territories, uh, you know, some fighting sequence that has a result. Very rarely does someone only make gains without making concessions. Go is inherently a game of compromise, right? Uh, and, you know, sometimes you get more than your opponent. Sometimes you get a bit more than your opponent. But rarely do you get much more than your opponent. Usually, the, trade of, the, the balance of trade is actually pretty even. And you would be doing a disservice of the game. We do a disservice to the game every day when we don't consider accurately not only what we are gaining or what we are losing, but also what the opponent is gaining and losing. And we, we try to look at it in a more uh, multifaceted way. And this is very hard, right? This is a very huge psychological problem that everyone has. Uh, but I just wanted to bring a little bit more awareness for it in, in, in the lecture, I guess. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think probably Ko is the best example of people's mindset of becoming less and less rational, um, be sort of developing, because Ko's are some of the more difficult things to handle rationally and go, because the concepts are so hard to understand, and often our instincts and our emotions take over, and that's when things go wrong. He won, but it took 15 Ko's. His opponent's talent is overwhelming. I'm pretty sure it's around 15 Ko's. I, I mean it. Like, okay, uh, wait, let's go. I, I, you guys think I'm joking, right? But there were many Ko's that game, like many, many Ko's. So let's see. There was, um, oh, there was the first Ko on the lower left. There was, um, there was this Ko that we played. Then, yeah, so we played, the, we actually ended up playing this Ko again later in the game. So it sort of counts twice. But like, then we played this co, right? Then we played this co on the, on the lower side. Then we played this co again, right? Um, then later in the game, we, oh, we played this co for my group, right? Then we, yeah, we kept playing this co. Then we played this co. Then eventually, I tricked white and made a co on the lower right, which is how I won. So this this was a game of co's. Um, and yeah, that's why the game took 359 moves. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, highly questionable game. So yeah, this this was the not the final example, but the last example, sort of a bonus example. 
I want to take a moment and sort of recap what I've been discussing and consider what's going on. So, very often, people, the conclusion I want to make is that very often, people assign value to things in Go, and they assign value in isolation to what the rest, what's happening in the rest of the game. And you can see this in codes when people fixate on winning the codes without considering the consequences. You can see this when, um, when my opponent, um, not my opponent, my student, um, let's find the move. Yeah, when my opponent played this, no, opponent, you're saying opponent, my student played this move to protect his territory. And the main reason is that he thought it's his territory. So he has a psychological compunction to keep it. And that's just something that happens to people, right? Happens to me all the time. Um, the important thing is that first white, uh, white co-group got captured. Um, a, related, a related concept could be the sunk cost fallacy. Yeah, yeah, I mean, for sure. Sunk cost fallacy happens a lot in Go, yes. So for example, a good example of sunk cost fallacy, um, where you sort of, you do something, like you, in, like, you keep investing into something that's bad, just because you've already invested in it, right? White here should tenuki, but white kept investing, right? White kept investing because he'd already invested, right? And every single one of these moves that white played could be done without. It would be better to not play them, would be better to tenuki, but white, you know, some cost fallacy. And that's just something that happens to people. The really important thing, I think, in order to sort of increase your... Um, awareness of this thing is, first of all, to be aware that Go is not a game of absolutes. Like, the game is always more nuanced than you think, and there's always more of an exchange of resources than a transition of resources. Never is someone completely swindled, because they got nothing and their opponent got everything. And the, the thing that many people make a mistake in doing is that they don't even try to take all of those factors into account, they focus only on specific factors, you know? So for example, earlier somebody suggested playing h9, right? Um, when somebody suggested playing h9, right? What they were thinking is, I want to limit black's potential, right? That's what they were thinking. When they were thinking of playing h9 at this point. And the reason that that doesn't hold up is that white isn't thinking of himself. Like, maybe black's ponuki is slightly less effective, but this move is useless. This stone isn't making points. This stone isn't really weakening the ponuki. It's maybe limiting its scope a little bit, right? But ultimately, it's a very ineffective stone. So white actually didn't, like, the person who suggested this, I think, did not fully consider that he's spending a move. Like, I think what White was thinking was, I'd like to have a move here, but White didn't consider, oh, I have to spend a move here, which is different. That's worse, right? Um, yeah, unless you're an AI, you make these mistakes all the time. Although I guess then even different networks tuning give different results, but their thought process is much more sound than ours, right? Um, um, yeah, I, <laughs> Lei says, I, I definitely feel swindled on a regular basis. Well, then you should reconsider that because you rarely get swindled as much as you do, as you think you do. Like very often people get a result that's slightly bad and they feel terrible because they focus only on the part that they lost, right? And that, there's a good example of that in my earlier game with Telegraph Go, which uh, um, Black lost this territory on the lower side, got ample compensation, right? In the form of this wall got Q2 incentive, got D2, right? And, and Sente, but he thought he's 20 points behind because he merely focused on losing the territory. Stop playing Fox 6 Duns, Kappa. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking of all the times I've self Atari's in Endgame. Okay, self Atari's in Endgame are an exception to this point. Yeah, gotta get out of that hellhole, Dave. Fox 6 done, you know? I noticed a couple of high-level streamers say X-Move should be good enough, and 
I so rarely have that mindset. Hmm, I see. So, yeah, maybe the, the thing I want to uh, sort of wrap up with, I suppose, is that try, whenever you feel strongly about something, or you're focusing very strongly on one specific aspect of the game, a specific territory, we didn't cover this, but many people fixate on attacking groups uh, way too much. And that's a problem I've had in the past. It's hard to do it during the game, but after the game, please try and be aware of the, th the parts of the game that you weren't thinking about, right? And this, this harkens back, maybe some of you here will have watched my lecture on, uh, on exchanges that I made, where I'm discussing like one move exchanges, the goods and bads of exchanges, and whether you should make exchanges and which exchanges you should make. The key is to consider the opportunity cost of what you're doing, like what you could be doing instead, right? Um, which is how one would, uh, in this situation, prevent themselves from playing A, because you realize, oh, I could be playing a better move. And you need to consider the costs of what you're doing, what you're giving over. And that's very, it's very hard to do that consistently, but I think that formalizing that, at least when you review, is a really good habit, because then you'll realize, you know, for example, White would never have played this move, right? White would never have played this move at his level. He's, you know, 4Q, 4Q is pretty strong, right? A 4Q understands that this stone isn't worth everything that Black got, right? But he still played it in the moment. And the moment that you think about that after the game and you realize that you're giving this over to Black and you have that awareness, I think you'll start to fix the problem. Or you'll never fix it, but you'll come closer to fixing it. Uh, after all, that's all we can do in Go. We can just approximate the perfect style of play. We can never reach it, right? Uh, one big point which came up in the first AlphaGo games, Redmond commented, were def the fluidity of the game. The AI is reevaluating constantly and playing deliberately flexible moves, as far as I understood. Yes, exactly. That's great, Flutter Mouse. An a something that an AI understands is that the only thing that matters is winning the game. The AI doesn't assign value to stuff. The AI just picks the best move, right? And humans can't really do that. But we can catch ourselves when we are being overly unreasonable about the things that we are assigning value to, right? Um, so the point is that an, an AI doesn't care if it gives you, if it sacrifices a group, or if it gives you a ponuki, or, you know, it doesn't care as long as it's the best choice to win the game. But we care about that kind of thing. And that, you know, as I'm not saying that we should stop caring about that, right? It's just that we should be aware when we are caring about it too much or when we are... When we are doing something that our understanding in Go actually would say that is not correct. Like, I'm not asking people to gain, like, an amazing, like, five-head understanding of the game of Go. I'm just asking White to reconsider why he's playing this move and why it wouldn't be good to play it now, right? And a lot of you will improve very much once you do that. All of us would improve much once we do that. Uh, it's funny that you bring that up. Yesterday I played an Eitan. I was so fixated on center points and lost little points here and there throughout the game. Eventually lost by over 15 points. Instead of gaining, I focused on reducing. I see. Oh. You were fixated on reducing center points, and eventually you lost because of that, I guess. Um, yeah, you will notice every move Redmond is surprised by... by yeah, is, is surprised, and he needs to reevaluate AlphaGo's uh, understanding. Something bots will do is that they don't care... Like, another thing that humans do very often, and why beginners have trouble tanukiing, is that they have a recency bias towards the game, right? And AI doesn't really care about that, right? Um, yeah, Oscar says stop being human confirmed lol. Secret of go play good moves, don't play bad moves. Oh, I hope that's not the takeaway for this lecture. Thanks Oscar, in my next time I'll ask myself, am I being emotional here? Yeah, I, I'd ask myself, what am I, what am I being obsessed by? What am I focusing on in the game? Because if you're thinking about something a lot during the game, you're forgetting to think about other stuff, right? Uh, and that's that's one of the problems.
So, you know, if White had thought about anything except this stone, he wouldn't have captured it, you know? Um, like, he wouldn't have cut here in the first place. But he did that, right? And as long as he, later in the game, like, later after playing the game, he realizes, oh, I was fixating on this cut, and I should be thinking about the whole board, and enclosing corners, and playing on big sides, right? And peeping to get more, sorry, and peeping to get more efficient stone placement, he would have been fine, right? Okay. Um... I love how excited and baffled he is about the moves. Yeah, R Redmond's, Redmond's commentary is nice. I've actually enjoyed Redmond's commentary in the past, so I haven't checked it much that much very in very recent times. Um, the other issue is being able to see exchanges through reading. Uh, reading is a separate issue, though you will see that your reading will improve once you stop assuming that your opponent will do what you want. Like, a lot of people read very... Th this is a se completely separate topic, but there's a phenomenon called reading go, where people read very far, but don't read critically for their opponent's move. Which is a little bit more what you're pushing towards, I think. Um, like what you're referring to in that comment. It would be harder uh, to be more reasonable if reading becomes an issue to visualize exchanges. That's also true, yes. It is true that if you have trouble visualizing the end result, your decision making will be worse. Um, Redmond's commentary on Alpha is what got me into Go. Nice. Um, wow, people love Redmond here. Good. Yeah, I love Redmond too. Okay. Um, also he has a YouTube channel, right? Anyway, um, speaking of YouTube channels, this lecture will be up on YouTube. Um, if anyone wants to rewatch, um, though probably it's more for people who haven't watched, haven't been able to catch the stream. Uh, I'll be wrapping it up for now. Um, I thought that um, this would be a good topic to sort of bring awareness to people of how decision making is a little bit um, skewed by our emotions, our fixations, our obsessions, and I hope that this helped. And yeah, um, other than that, I I don't know. Um, visit the Nordic God Dojo website if you're not a member, uh, or even if you are, and there's some good articles there. And uh, even if you don't want to subscribe and stuff. And, you know, we um, we do have the Ghost School as well, if you're interested in that. Thanks to everyone who watched. And, yeah, uh, that'll be all. Is it necessarily bad to give in to emotion and obsession? Yes, usually. Most of the time. Um, <laughs> that's the conclusion I'll be in. Um, okay. So, uh, thank you everyone for watching, and I'll be ending it here. Is there anyone we can raid? Uh, wait, uh, the Nordic God Dojo doesn't follow any channels, basically. So, okay, let's not raid anyone. I uh, don't want to find someone right now. Yeah, thanks for watching. I'll be, um, I'll be out. Yeah, and back in uh, Nordic God Dojo streams every two weeks. So in two weeks, someone will be doing lecture. Maybe me, maybe one of the other teachers. Yeah, see you guys. Thanks.